And so my particular contribution I've been thinking about for a while and um, wanted to use this opportunity to test it out on this audience. And I hope we're able to have a bit of a conversation at the end of this. I, I know it's technically a keynote, but I was hoping for some interactivity um, a, a, about these ideas, because I know a lot of us are working in this space and thinking about these issues. So the title is Litigation Outcome Prediction, Access to Justice and Legal Endogeneity, and I will define those terms as I go. Uh, so just to set the stage, this is primarily a US-based um, project that I, or, or chapter that I'm working on. Um, uh, but I'd also love to hear about experiences in other jurisdictions. But at least in the United States, we have a serious and persistent civil justice gap. And uh, by civil justice gap, I mean when studies identify civil legal needs that people and households have, they also identify uh, large proportions of those civil legal needs um, are not receiving any legal help. And so just as a, an illustration of the persistence of this problem, in 1994, the American Bar Foundation did a huge study and found that half of low and moderate income households that they surveyed had faced at least one recent civil pro legal problem but only one quarter to one third had turned to the justice system to help solve that problem. And um, decades after that initial survey, still 71%, this is a repeat survey that was done by another entity, but similar, if not worse conclusions, 71% um, of low income households had experienced a civil legal need, but 86% had received inadequate or no legal help. So what do we mean by civil legal need? Um, what we mean are case types like evictions, like uh, child support, uh, like um, child custody, divorces, um, and the like. So the sort of bread and butter of the civil, civil legal system in the United States and the types of legal claims that have se serious effects on the st economic stability, well-being, health, and safety of the households that experience these needs. So this is a big problem. Um, and why? Why do we have such a civil legal gap in the United States? Well, uh, for one, there's no guaranteed right to counsel uh, funded by, by the government in civil cases, most civil cases, as distinguished from criminal cases. And so that leaves the, the private market essentially um, for lawyers to fill this gap and also publicly financed legal aid organizations. But of course, there are not enough of those resources to go around. So I mentioned I'm uh, joining from the state of Georgia. Uh, in our state, um, perpetually, this number shifts between five or six, but typically five or six of our counties have zero lawyers living in them. Um, and so if you are a poor person and you can't afford to drive to one of our major population centers um, to meet with a lawyer or nowadays to Zoom, um, then you're stuck. And our, our, st our state level legal aid provider lawyers, those lawyers, what we call ride circuit around the state. And this is a shot from um, the Clay County Library that says legal aid first Wednesday from 1.30 to 3.30. Um, so this is two hours a month of free legal services in a county that has zero resident attorneys and 18 additional counties in our state have only one or two lawyers who live there. So this is a serious problem. Now, why am I talking about unmet civil legal needs at a conference on computational legal studies? Well, because a lot of people think well, maybe computationally driven litigation outcome prediction tools might be able to fill the civil justice gap. Um, and I'll go through the theory here uh, in a minute, but the idea is maybe there is you know, an algorithmic savior here who can help, or that, <laughs> I'm personifying um, an algorithm by calling it who, but that can uh, predict the outcome of cases and help um, create certainty, which lowers prices, et cetera. So I'll go through the theory in a minute and then the practice. And I think the question, the answer to this question though is maybe. Um, it's a resounding maybe at this point, at least. Um, so I'll walk through why I think that. All right, so first let me define my terms. When I'm saying computationally driven um, outcome prediction tools, 
I'm talking about machine and deep learning methods, but also just plain old statistical methods, right? A regression can actually, you know, predict an outcome or at least explain one. Um, and so what I'm talking about is this suite of tools that we're all used to using and experimenting with, forecasting the outcome of a civil litigation event. So it could be the conclusion of the case, will the person get predict, get evicted or not? Um, or we could have a set of tools that target intermediate events in court. Um, so for example, whether evidence might be admitted or not, or in a more complex proceeding, whether a case might resolve on a motion to dismiss um, or a, a motion for summary judgment, say. Um, so I'm sweeping in all potential outcomes when I'm talking about outcome prediction tools, but I am for the purposes of this talk, only thinking about civil. Um, and that's because I think criminal outcome prediction, so for example, tools that might predict sentencing or predict conviction or not, or predict plea, a plea bargain or not, um, again, this is all in the US system, uh, are similar in many ways, but also different in important ways. Um, but I do think a lot of what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of this talk might be extended to criminal cases as well. All right, so that's what I mean by these tools. Now, what is the theory that leads some people at least to suggest that such tools might actually help fill the civil um, legal needs gap or address the civil legal needs crisis? Um, well, this is because, as I alluded to before, there's a lot of uncertainty many times um, when would-be clients or potential clients confront a problem that could be a legal problem. And then there's also a lot of uncertainty when those would-be clients walk into a lawyer's office and say, here's the, here's what happened to me. Um, any of you who have represented clients know that often what comes out of their mouths is, is quite jumbled and you have to sort of wade through it and figure out what's in here that's actionable. You know, what's the law in this area if you're not a specialist? Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty that makes lawyers' jobs necessary and makes our ability to weed through those facts and assess the application of the relevant law, um, you know, quite pricey in most cases. Um, and so, you know, outcome uncertainty can come from the law itself being unclear. It can come from the discretion that various actors in the legal system exercise. And so it may be hard to predict the exercise of that discretion. Um, people, you know, clients, would-be clients and lawyers themselves might just make mistakes in understanding the fact pattern at hand, and they might make errors in identifying which legal rule is applicable, and then at least in a common law jurisdiction, they might make errors in trying to identify or, or identify the relevant precedent. Um, or authority applicable to the situation. So I'm drawing here on Gillian Hadfield's work and sort of understanding and pulling apart the sources of vagueness and the sources of outcome uncertainty that in turn might drive up the cost of legal services. Um, and so then what do we think, how do we think that computational methods might um, ride to the rescue? So I think there's three theoretical, three ways in theory that outcome prediction tools um, might be able to essentially act as a force multiplier for lawyers. So allow lawyers uh, to make viability assessments more quickly and more efficiently, and therefore extend, um, ex expand the number of clients they can help. Um, uh, and even these tools could be put into the hands of clients themselves in, and help them wade through uh, the viability of their claims. So theory number one is just that, you know, you assemble a large enough training set, build a model, um, and you might be able to detect patterns even in how courts have interpreted fairly vague laws or how parties have exercised discretion. Um, and with enough information, you might also be able to correct those information deficits and asymmetries I referred to on the previous slide. So ergo, the cost of legal services falls, access to justice increases. Um, so this is the, the sort of basic idea that I think you see a lot um, sort of bandied about that, you know, actually what we can do is we can, we can identify the easy cases and we can, you know, maybe even avoid court at all, or at least lower the cost and increase the efficiency of legal services providers and extend, uh, extend representation to more people. Number two is related, um, but it's more focused on thinking about the lawyer's decisions in um, building a portfolio of cases, right? So if I'm a private lawyer, I'm weighing which one, which of my cases 
uh, seems to have a high probability of winning and bringing in some money so I can keep the lights on. Um, so my sort of low risk, uh, sure, sure win cases. And then I'm weighing, I'm trying to balance those out against cases that might be higher risk. Um, and in fact, I might just want to get rid of all my high risk cases. I'm not a risk person. I have no appetite for risk. I may want to be able to select the cases that um, appear to be meritorious um, and, and lower my exposure to risk. And so if we have reliable case outcome prediction or, or litigation event outcome prediction um, algorithms, then lawyers can make smarter, more efficient case selection decisions, choose the winning cases, um, and therefore waste, waste less time on loser cases. And again, cost of legal services falls, access to justice increases, lawyers are realizing more profit on the cases to it in which they do extend um, representation. Okay, third access to justice theory, and I'll explain who this guy is and why his picture is on the slide in a second. Um, so again, relate, thinking about lawyers' risk preferences and how they might use outcome prediction tools, um, so maybe you're a lawyer who's actually, you know, fairly risky, you know, you have a high appetite for risk, or, you know, practice is doing pretty well, and you're sort of innovative and entrepreneurial, and you want to sort of figure out, well, which, where, where are the hidden gems, right? What case types are out there but are under-resourced? And folk wisdom or sort of, you know, what my partners down the hall say would say, ah, oh, those are duds, those are losers, don't take those cases. But in fact, if you have good enough prediction tools, you might be able to identify, um, you know, sort of overlooked case types and really make a lot of money by shifting your practice decisions into those case types. And the reason that what I'll explain what's on the screen here, this is actually from a project I did several years ago that has very little to do with anything around prediction or machine learning or deep learning or anything like that. Um, but this guy on the screen, his name is Greg Shavitz, and he was a personal injury lawyer in the state of Florida. And he discovered in the process of representing one of his clients that his clients had massive unpaid wages, so unpaid overtime to which his client was entitled under the law. At least that's what Mr. Shavitz thought. So this guy essentially turned his personal injury practice into a wage and hour practice. And I contend was nearly single-handedly responsible for starting a giant boom in Fair Labor Standards Act cases, which are wage and hour cases that will, were filed per year in the U.S. federal district courts. And in fact, spread that boom out of Florida to other, to other, other states in the country. Um, and so I view sort of as I'm thinking about how access to justice might be enhanced by computationally driven outcome prediction tools, I think about lawyers like Greg Shabbats, like this guy's entrepreneurial, this guy's innovative. He hit upon a new practice area. He transformed his practice, um, made a ton of money, and then opened up access to workers who had unpaid wage claims, um, access to justice for them because more and more lawyers followed on and, and shifted their case, shifted their case selection practices over to wage an hour. Um, again, this was pre-computation, right? So this boom, as you can see on this line graph, started in the early 2000s and really petered out around the 2016, 17, where this graph actually cuts off. Um, but one could imagine uh, similar effects happening if there are effective outcome prediction tools and lawyers are savvy and sort of hunting through and finding predictors that may, you know, may have previously been overlooked that help indicate that a case type might actually be, um, be worth pursuing. So again, cost of legal services falls, access to justice increases. So there's, these are three potential ways, at least starting from theory, um, all of which, by the way, assume well-functioning um, outcome prediction algorithms, which I'll talk about in a minute, but that if those prediction algorithms work and are widely available and lawyers use them, um, we might ultimately see sort of, a, they, they might be a boon to um, clients who otherwise would have a hard time finding representation. So I'm using a lot of mites and maybes, and that's because I think that uh, there are limitations and there are actually problems with the story that I've just been telling you. Um, but before I get to that, uh, I searched far and wide for examples of um, 
of tools that are actually deployed that are in practice that are being used directly by low or by services, uh, legal services organizations that serve low and middle income clients. Um, so in my actual chapter, I go through, you know, what's the state of the scholarship? What are scholars doing in outcome prediction? What are the commercial applications um, of outcome prediction? And I know, you know, sort of, we've got a lot of scholars here who do this work now. Um, and most of us, I think, are fairly passively familiar, at least with some commercial applications. Um, so I won't spend time going over those now. Um, but when I did look for examples of tools out there that are actually being used to predict outcomes directly to serve low and middle income clients, so not some of these indirect you know, ultimately increasing the number of lawyers in the market kind of theories that I just went through. But do we have examples of outfits or entities that are actually using outcome prediction um, in the provision of legal services to poor people? And I could only find two, and I maybe didn't find other examples. I found plenty of scholars, by the way, who talk about access to justice ramifications of their work. But I only found two examples of actual on the ground use. And I'd love it if folks have other examples to send my way, not just in the US, but elsewhere in the world. Um, and so one is Community Legal Services of Philadelphia, um, a guy named Michael Hollander, who's, a, who's a, a coder of some sort, I can't quite remember his background, but also went to law school developed a tool called expungement generator. And I should say it's not actually a predictive tool in the sense that it's a, it's a machine learning or deep learning algorithm of some kind. Um, what it is, it essentially applies a set of statutorily determined rules to figure out whether someone's criminal record could be expunged and then assists in generating the paperwork um, for community legal services lawyers to manage that or handle that in expungement. So it's predictive in the sense that it is predicting whether a certain um, criminal record is eligible for expungement. It's not predictive in the sense that we might be more, you know, used to using the term in the sense that there's a classifier operating under the hood. But nevertheless, um, this is actually the snippet, a screenshot from GitHub, but if you read the documentation on GitHub, you see that one of the reasons for, or one of the explanations or the rationales for this tool's existence is exactly this sort of full force multiplication idea that if you have high volume and you can reduce, reduce the amount of time that lawyers spend, then you can um, expand the number of clients who can be served. Um, the other example is there's a, a professor uh, in a family law clinic at a U.S. Uh, law school who has developed a tool um, that does some similar sort of rules application work um, in family law cases, I believe, um, child support or custody, though the, the details are escaping me at the moment. And she's been working with Crivella Technologies, so an, an AI company, um, to then develop a predictive version of of this tool. So the idea is, I believe, um, to identify the arguments that would be most uh, convincing to the courts when these cases go up on appeal. So this seems to be interesting. This seems to be a place where she and um, her partners are experimenting with actually using prediction methodologies in the way that I think of prediction um, that, that are explicitly designed to increase access to justice by allowing their lawyers to be more efficient and their law students learning in this clinic to be more efficient in um, choosing arguments that will be presented to the courts. Um, so again, you know, scarce, scarce examples, sparse examples of these types of tools being used directly to serve low and moderate income clients. Um, and, uh, and lots of activity on the scholarship front, lots of activity on the commercial front, um, but scholars aren't out there representing clients. And of course, commercial applications are quite expensive and generally not available to the types of legal services organizations or even the small law firms or civil practitioners who might be the most likely uh, to be able to use them to expand uh, access to justice. All right. so. Why, why is it that I could only find two examples? You know, maybe I have bad Googling skills, um, but I think that really we, we have some, 
some problems um, with data access and with money. Um, and so with respect to data, let me get, so data and money are intertwined here, right? So if we think about the types of legal needs that I mentioned in the beginning, so evictions, um, you know, child support, uh, child custody, access to public benefits, uh, these are often by definition claims held by low-income people. Um, so if you are, are if you are eligible for public benefits, you are by definition low-income, you're a low-income client, there's not a lot of money there, so there's not a lot of incentive um, for, for private companies to invest money in, in assembling data um, around those case types or invest money in building tools that would serve clients who have those case types. Um, and so what's at the heart of all this though is in the United States at least, we have very limited public access to court data in bulk. So on the federal level, you have to pay uh, 10 cents a page to access court records, even search results. So it's quite costly if you go directly to the courts. The state courts have a really disparate siloed set of uh, data access and court records access systems. Um, so the amount of just, just from grunt work required to assemble a large set of uh, state court records is really you know, quite daunting. Um, and so we, so uh, a research group that I'm a part of um, has a piece in, an opinion piece in essentially in science that sort of walks through these data access problems and, uh, and, you know, really makes the pitch to the courts that we really need to open up public access to court data in the United States um, to make these sorts of tools uh, cost effective or to make their development possible, um, given the front end data assembly costs that are involved in building out any sort of tool of this sort. Um, but you might be thinking, well, what about all the commercial applications, right? All the private players here, which at least in the United States, that market is dominated by Lexis, Westlaw, and to a lesser extent, Bloomberg Law. And then we have Fastcase and a bunch of other entrants uh, in the, into the market, including startups by, you know, folks who I know have, have spoken at this, at this conference. Um, what about those, right? Why don't they just make their, make their data publicly or make their data available? Or why don't they spin off free versions um, for legal service providers and for, for other lawyers who represent low and middle income clients? Well, they might, maybe they would do that. Um, but the problem is when private entities assemble their own separate repository or troves of court data, uh, they're using their own sense, sets of criteria for deciding what's in and what's out. And so studies have shown that the main, the, the main players in the legal research and legal, legal data provision space and some of the newer entrants have wildly divergent uh, sets of court data and court documents and records that they're sitting on. So whatever tools they're building on top of those data sets are producing really divergent predictions because they're being fed massively divergent data. Um, so here's an example. There was a study that a bunch of law librarians did where they tasked their team, their research team, with answering what seemed to be fairly simple questions right, that there's really no judgment, no exercise of judgment needed. And so this was one example. How many opinions on motions for summary judgment has Judge Barbara Lynn of the Northern District of Texas issued in patent cases? Um, and so, you know, it was as of a certain date, right? So assume that the dates were all consistent across all the searches. And so um, these librarians searched, I wanna say nine or 10 different services and the answers ranged from nine opinions to 32 opinions. And so, you know, apologies for the abbreviated profanity, but WTF, right? So what does it mean when we cannot, our, our, our main, our, or our, our sort of, our main and more minor in the United States, um, private data, legal data providers, uh, can, cannot agree remotely on the answers to what seem to be fairly basic um, questions. And so Gerald, I see in the chat, wonder if the average was correct. I don't recall actually um, what's what was correct. Now this just raises the question of 
what is correct, right? So um, I suppose they could have gone to, to PACER, the federal uh, public ask, access to court record system, gone straight to the court and uh, tried to uh, pull down all, motion, all summary judgment opinions there and compared them. I don't know if they did. Um, it's a good question though. And even what I just said, going to PACER to pull down all of Barbara Lynn's summary judgment opinions would itself be an expensive and onerous process given the, the um, page fee and the just horrible design of PACER. Um, so anyway, this, just, this is just to make the point that um, you know, we really don't, we don't even know the ground truth, right? To answer Daryl or to, to Daryl's point in the chat. Um, and uh, because we don't have public access to court data and the private access that exists is, is really sort of all over the place and moreover cost prohibitive um, for lawyers who are representing low income clients who you know, aren't paying or aren't paying much. Um, so data limitations and the connected set of money limitations, I think are one big reason why we haven't seen more of a pro proliferation of access to justice oriented tools um, that predict litigation events. I also think there's some methods limitations and these aren't specific to access to justice applications. I think these are methods applications that apply across the board to, um, you know, to, to Lexis's, Westlaw's, um, et cetera's uh, best prediction tools. Um, and so, all right, so what is explainability? You know, explainable AI is now not new news anymore, but a lot of the commercially available tools at least don't do a good job of explaining you know, which features are most predictive. Um, and so they, they still are, we're still sort of in black box world to some extent. Scholars aren't always good at this either when they're, you know, so excited about their F1 score or whatever, um, that gets, tends to take uh, sort of the headlines. And so explainability is not actually a methods limitation. Um, we know that there are explainable uh, their explainable approaches to prediction. I don't know if, if, if as a field, either the commercial side or scholarship, anybody sort of landed or coalesced or everybody has coalesced around a particular approach to explainability. Um, so that might be that, you know, explainability is maybe not in its maturity with respect to legal scholars who are doing computational work or with respect to the commercial side of things. Um, but it's something important. It's something that sometimes appears to be neglected, um, at least in my review of scholarship and um, commercial tools. The other one I think is, is harder, and I'm gonna talk more about this in, in, in a minute. But you know, this was an article in, in Quantum Magazine um, where profiling Melanie Mitchell. And so, you know, if I ever get my photo taken, like staring off into the distance like that, I feel like I will have arrived <laughs> as a scholar. Um, but, you know, she looks very wise looking into the distance. But um, the point here, the reason I have this on here is, is algorithms are not good at reasoning by analogy. And legal reasoning at heart is reasoning by analogy. And so until we can get to the point where our, you know, our, as Dr. Mitchell said, our state of the art neural nets are actually able to replicate the type of sort of building block assembly of arguments and drawing from precedent and, uh, and reasoning by analogy that lawyers and judges do every day until we get to the point where we can replicate that. I think we're just, that's just a, you know, sort of a, 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 a wall um, limiting the ability of, of any method to effectively really replicate the type of legal reasoning and predict the outcomes um, that, that our courts generate. Um, and this is something that, you know, may be more relevant to the common law system. I'd, I'd really be interested to hear what's going on um, or what other folks think about the analogical reasoning problem in other jurisdictions. Um, but, but I think this is something that, that, um, that is a place where we should all collectively push um, and where, you know, the methods need to get better. And I'll talk in a minute again about why I think this particular deficit, this particular method limitation um, might actually be bad for access to justice um, and might be bad, uh, it might close the courthouse doors um, if, if predictive tools are, are made available and used very widely. 
Okay, so just going into my kind of last set of points here. Um, and um, so if, so this is where I want to get to unintended consequences and maybe try to, you know, provoke some thoughts. Um, so even assuming we fix everything that I just uh, said, and well, not assuming we fix the analogical reasoning piece, because I think that's going to hang around for a long time. And I see in the chat that, you know, researchers have been trying to work on this for a really long time. Yes, um, clearly we haven't solved it. Um, but I think even if we fix the data problem, even if we fix the money problem, uh, maybe if we got a little better in analogical reasoning, um, I still, I think that there, there may be unintended consequences that we need to watch out for if we are going toward a world in which outcome prediction tools are becoming quite common. Um, so I think there could be harm to would-be litigants who don't get representation because a predictive tool says your claim isn't viable, but it's because those litigants are bringing cases of first impression to, to a lawyer, right? Or, or a, a, a fact pattern that makes that, that is novel um, or the, the claim or the client is somehow an outlier. Um, as we know, such, such folks, you know, if we think about how predictive tools work, such folks might be predicted to, you know, fall into the not successful, not viable um, category and be denied representation. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and so I think that could potentially uh, have a negative effect on access to justice. And then also this is sort of ideas that many others have batted around, but I think, you know, we, we risk shutting down a lot of the variation and renewal and flexibility that characterizes the common law system as a whole if we are using outcome prediction tools, which are by definition conservative and path dependent. Um, and so what's the net effect on access to justice if we have both widespread use of outcome prediction tools, which you know could in theory open up the courthouse doors, but then have some of these consequences that actually may end up shutting the courthouse doors. I don't know. I think it's an unresolved set of empirical questions, but we need to be careful, um, given that we're still you know sort of in the infancy of this this field. Um, we need to be careful in thinking through these consequences. Okay, just a, a little bit more on, um, on these unintended consequences. So I think it's useful to walk through um, as a thought experiment, a case that came before the California Supreme Court in 2005. Um, it involved two women, Elisa B and Emily B. They were a lesbian couple, not married at the time, obviously not allowed to be married, um, not married, but had decided together that um, Emily, would, uh, that they would use artificial insemination on, with Emily's eggs, she would carry their kids that they would raise together as a couple. Well, that all happened, they split up though, and Emily was trying to go after Elisa for child support. Um, Elisa says, don't have any obligation to pay child support. We weren't married, I'm not biologically related to the kids. You know, there's no precedent here, you can't enforce this. Um, and so what ultimately ended up happening is the case made its way to the Supreme Court of California in 2005, the high court there in that state, and the court ruled in favor of Emily and mandated that Elisa pay child support. To do so, the court did a, a, did a sort of, you know, building block, um, made a building block set of moves. So it pulled from a variety of different, really sort of on their face, pretty disparate um, set of precedent cases, and including Kate, one case where um, a half-sister raised her half-brother and she acted in the role of a parent, cases where there was a non-biological mother, um, a non-biological father, there were th cases where there were three possible parents, um, and all of this was despite the fact that the Uniform Parentage Act, which was the statute that governed, defined parents as a mother and a father. But nevertheless, the court made its way through all picking and choosing from this grab bag of precedent and built an argument that led to the conclusion that Emily should get child support from Elisa. Now, query whether an algorithm could make those same set of moves. 
Um, so there's under here, I have problems. It's a series of analogical jumps by the court. And in fact, when courts make these sets of analogical jumps, right, they, they, are, they are exercising discretion about which cases to pull in and which to disregard. And that discretion may be influenced by a judge's ideological commitments or maybe public opinion. Political scientists argue about this. But I submit that this is really hard to model. Right, the, the building block nature of, of analogical reasoning is really hard to model. And it's also really hard to model the influence of these other sort of extra legal set of factors, potentially that are influencing which blocks the court chooses to put in its tower in its building blocks. Um, so I think that if our, if, our, uh, if our outcome prediction tools get really good, and you know they just get really good at sort of taking as their inputs all of the previous precedent. Okay, fine. But unless they can take on cases like Emily B and Elisa B and really replicate legal reasoning, as I was saying a minute ago, what you're ending up with is these sort of outlier claim or client types. Um, don't get legal representation, presumably, because they're every time their fact pattern is plugged into is plugged into a, a predictive tool, it spits out a you know thumbs down. Um, now maybe that's maybe that's exaggerated, maybe that's a straw man, but I do think it's something we should think about, given the conservative path dependent nature of um, of prediction, and we should think about who that leaves out. Um, if 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 the prediction uh, is unable to accomplish the the sort of legal reasoning that I mentioned, um, a related example might be let's say you know, a tenant comes into your office. You're a lawyer. That person has a criminal record. They're trying to fight an eviction. the The fact that that person has a criminal record reduces the chance of winning uh, the eviction defense. Right? The person is a less um, sort of less likable client, you know, maybe the conviction has some relevance to the eviction argument, something like that. But what happens here is if this person's getting a low viability score in this sort of algorithmic assessment of their claim or their defense, and it's on the basis of their old criminal record, then we're reducing that person to this sort of single highly predictive data point um, and it's their criminal record, right? And so the idea here is that there's sort of this dignitary harm involved with reducing people to, a, to feature sets um, and that, you know, someone might be not able to move beyond their worst past bad act if these predictive tools keep recycling that bad act. Um, at least with respect to the viability of future claims. And frankly, the other there are other real harms, for example, eviction. And if we're talking about low-income clients here, we may be talking about a loss of social mobility. Um, so again, it's the idea of path dependency, right? It's the idea of endogeneity, right? That um, we just keep repeating the same patterns. Um, and you know, as many of us know here, probably um, these are critiques that have been raised recently and as you know, far ago is 1976, um, you know, machine learning is not value neutral and even computers, um, as the second quote here, um, you know, computers are a tool of reinforcing high power hierarchies. Um, and so, you know, this is again, you know, maybe exaggerated, but I, it's something I think we're thinking, I think is worth thinking about, which is the, the, the bias replication nature or potential or risk excuse me, risk of predictive, predictive tools, which many, many, many people have written about, but what does that look like when it's specifically imported into the case selection decision um, that lawyers make? Okay, last thing, and then I think I'm wrapping up and I'd love to hear other folks' voices is, um, and again, this is a variation on what other, other scholars have talked about. Um, uh, sorry, there's a phone ringing. One second. Okay. Um, this is a variation on what other scholars have talked about um, in other contexts, but you know, as we know, the common law system it balances both flexibility and adherence to precedent. So, stare decisis. And um, if lawyers' case selection decisions are guided by path dependent algorithms, then uh, then what we may end up is a sort of super stare decisis. And here, I'm not even talking about judges using outcome prediction tools. I'm talking about lawyers using outcome prediction tools and deciding which sets of fact patterns and which legal arguments to feed to the courts. 
And if, if those decisions around fact patterns and legal arguments are too heavily determined by what has previously been successful, then just like the Emily B. Elisa B. example where those those would-be clients might not get representation, well, then, you know, our, our system of common law um, may get sort of locked down and ossified and lose its flexible nature where it can expand and contract um, in response to the real on-the-ground lived experiences that litigants bring to court. So they never get there if lawyers are the gatekeepers, and in fact, the algorithms are the gatekeepers um, for the lawyers. Okay, so I'll finish here. Here are just some ideas. Um, I'm always bad when I get to the end of these things about thinking about, well, what would actually fix, <laughs> fix these things? Um, so, you know, in terms of explainability, I mentioned already, you know, explainable AI is a thing. It has been a thing for a long time. I think explanation um, needs to be built into any tool or any scholarly endeavor to predict. And the GDPR has what's been interpreted by some scholars as a right to an explanation. And so there's even, there are even examples there of requiring explanation, you know, by, by fiat or by regulation. Um, uh, obvious improved analogical reasoning by AI. Um, but even if we're not great at analogical reasoning, I think maybe so with if, if folks are familiar with GPT-3, giant language model um, produced by OpenAI, which of course ingested lots and lots and lots of racism uh, in the, the training uh, corpora to which it was exposed. Um, and then of course spits back, you know, in its, in its language generation tasks, spits back racism um, unsurprisingly. The open AI teams have tried to overtrain uh, their models with sort of counter text as a way, once they identify these patterns um, as a way to counter them with, you know, I think mixed success, but there might be an idea here or a parallel to litigation prediction tools where we might overtrain predictive models with the types of cases um, that we think a court might accept, right? Or the, that are sort of edge cases that are outlier cases, um, overtrain to, pre to prevent that sort of ossification and endogeneity effect that I was talking about. Um, we might op adopt organizational mandates within law firms and lawyers offices that no decision should be made exclusively exclusively on the basis of algorithm output, algorithmic output. So maybe no rejection decision should be made. And this is Kathy O'Neill in her book that probably many of us have read, have sort of has a mentioned a version of this sort of a Hippocratic oath for data scientists. Maybe government agencies could keep an eye on the deployment of these tools and um, start to monitor areas in which enfor or not enforcement, excuse me, but um, uh, representation seems to dry up, and then government agencies that do have an enforcement mandate might step in and, and represent clients themselves. Um, again, I'd love to hear ideas. I'd love to hear discussion and conversation on all of this. Um, like I said, I'm shaping this out as a chapter that's going to come out in David Langstrom's book, um, and that's my email there um, if you'd like to get in touch. All right, so I'll stop sharing. And then um, uh, L. Thorne McCarty. I don't know if you go by Thorne. I see your hand is up. Hello. <laughs> so that was a very interesting talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, so I, I'm not being entirely facetious, but, but um, let me give you a solution to your problem in a simple slogan. <laughs> um, don't predict outcomes, predict arguments. So the idea is that, and I think this is quite realistic as if you think about how lawyers approach cases, um, it's often difficult to get lawyers to agree on what the outcome of the case should be, but you can also often get them to agree on what are plausible arguments on both sides of the issue. And um, this actually has been an idea that people, that AI and law researchers, and I'm one of those, have, uh, have been uh, exploring for a long time. It, it, it's, it's, it's a hard problem to solve, but if you reorient your research on prediction, modeling, legal reasoning, and so on, to trying to construct 
plausible arguments on both sides of the case, I think you can make a lot of progress on many of the issues uh, that, that, you're, that you're talking about. I think, I think the predictability of plausible arguments, even just forgetting the technology, um, is much more robust among lawyers than the predictability of outcomes. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that that may, um, that may work, I think, for case types or claim types in which there are a variety of plausible arguments. I think that maybe some of the legal services type work um, that I mentioned uh, but, uh, at the outset, you know, so the evictions, the um, child custody, some of those may may have sort of a narrower band of, of acceptable arguments that get made. Um, but yes, I think I have to think through a little bit the extent to which the argument prediction piece solves the problem. Um, and I think you're right. I, I was purposely defining outcome as you know, the dispositive event, right? Or, or the, the event or the, or the full, you know, disposition of the claim. Um, and, and that was in part for, to create a thought experiment to work through. Um, but certainly that's not the only end to which uh, so, prediction could see, be. See, I think, I think that, that um, reorientation would even help you in something like the uh, Elisa B. California case. Because that's exactly mm -hmm. what the court did. <laughs> they mm -hmm. came up mm -hmm. with some far out argument. I don't know the case, but I, mm -hmm. from your, your uh, summary of it, they came out with some pretty far out arguments. And then mm -hmm. they chose, yes, we'll pick those arguments. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. if you had a tool that generated far out arguments, there you go. You have it. Yeah. Yeah. That's not right. easy to do. That's not right. easy to do. But, but, but that's a, a way to reorient your thinking, I think. Yeah, thank you. That's helpful. I we have a question. Um, yes, so can you hear me? I mean, um, is it yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, I have a couple of ideas, I guess. And um, but let me start with tying into what was just said um, in the previous discussion. So I think one, um, like argument prediction, of course, like it's much harder to do than outcome prediction. Um, but I think also it might just have a different role, especially with regard to the problem um, that you're primarily interested in, which is access to justice, because um, if it's just about deciding as a lawyer whether you want to take up the case, um, it's helpful to have as much dimensionality reduction as possible. So your case handling time is going to go up again if you just give them the argument. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to accept for now the premise that we want to predict outcomes. Um, and I think one of the problems that you also see in a lot of other machine learning that's trying to perfect scores is that there is inherent uncertainty in life. So if we're going to optimize for a perfect score, we're optimizing beyond nature. Um, so one might think about introducing limits to predictability in the sense that say we don't want to go above point A because we kind of decided that that's as much as we're going to get, and that's what we're expecting in terms of natural randomness. And then you can start evaluating how good you are at being wrong, um, which brings me to the next point that you're going to have a lot of bias in historical training data, and you want to be wrong in the case predictions that were historically biased, in the sense that then if you limit your perfect score, 2.8, you have 0.2 to be wrong at, but you want to be wrong at the cases that were historically discriminating. And I think that would be interesting because it would force us to actually do much more analysis on being wrong in good way. Um, so then I think another problem um, to consider is that we'll need some kind of like online learning um, because you also have statutes, even in a common law system, and it might just be that a change to a statute is going to make obsolete by law a lot of your training data, and we still have to figure out how to kind of eliminate the impact of data data from models and kind of retrain in an online fashion. Um, and then another thing that um, one could do is to um, kind of require 
that in your predictions that you're making, you're also, um, you basically combine two components uh, where one is what you're actually predicting and one is just a, a dice roll or a coin flip. Um, and you're weighing these according to some like factor, like one minus alpha and alpha, such that the lawyer also doesn't really know whether it's like whether they're getting the random prediction or not to make sure that it's a certain amount of noise gets into the system uh, to enable change. And then you might have more and less conservative models. Um, so one assuming that courts don't change course and one assuming that in certain ways they might change course. And you'd also always want to um, require that you're given an assessment of the certainty of your prediction, which some tools might do, others might not. Um, and depending on the representation that you're using to create the prediction, you can also kind of measure the distance of your case to the other cases to kind of show people how much of an outlier it is vis-a-vis uh, -vis your training data. So I think that was just a lot of rambling, but um, maybe there was some useful things um, in it. I hope so. Otherwise, yes. I apologize. For no, thank you. I was madly writing. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name and I can't see who's talking. Can you say um, again? Yeah, so um, I'm Corinna. Uh, so I think, um, well, Corinna Kupat from Max Planck Institute for Informatics and Coursera Software. So I'm okay. a computer thank science. You. All right. Thank you, Corinna. That's really helpful. I love the idea of, um, you know, being wrong in a good way. That's really, that's really interesting. Hi, um, I, I think I, I, I can ask my question now. Um, this is, uh, I'm Hao Kang from uh, Singapore Management University. So um, uh, thanks for um, agreeing to be our keynote speaker for this conference. Um, just want to add on a couple of things from uh, Professor McCarthy and from uh, Corina's uh, very, very uh, good points. Uh, um, first, and, and of course, thank you for the presentation. It, it was it, it's it's the sort of presentation that um, raises so many interesting questions uh, that I, I think we don't have time to even uh, discuss uh, all, all of all of uh, the possible uh, questions that uh, are, are have have so many interesting dimensions to explore, right? But uh, uh, some some thoughts, initial thoughts that I had was um, um, in predicting arguments. Uh, there, there, there are already some approaches using that uh, either through, through um, even, even in the machine learning world uh, where you jointly train your inputs uh, and uh, to, to attend to or generate uh, reasons. So you could, you could use something like GPT-3 type of models with language generation to also generate a, a sequence of um, text that would represent a valid reason or a, a reason. A, a possible argument. So, so even in the machine learning world, I think they are trying to use that uh, sort of approach to see whether it's possible to not just predict outcomes. So, but this is sort of like jointly predicting outcomes and also predicting uh, possible arguments. So, of course, this is premised on the idea that you have available to you um, arguments to train on uh, apart from outcomes. So, um, but having said that, this this is like building on what Corinne has said. It seems like this would be much more useful to a legal professional rather than your typical uh, end user who uh, might not um, understand what these arguments really mean to them, right? And, and they're really much more interested in the outcome. So then the question is whether there is still a use for a, a sort of black box type of predicting tool, right? Which does not determine the outcomes. Uh, you're of course not relying on them to adjudicate between uh, claims, but rather use them as an additional data point. So it's sort of like the um, those uh, election polls uh, predictions where they do statistical analysis, and 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 that could be an additional uh, data point, especially if you have a good uh, and a good aggregator, perhaps you know, um, rather than rely on one single model. But if you have different types of models, different family models, where sort of mixture of experts um, approach you could have the wisdom of the crowds kind of a principle working that uh, you might arrive at a, uh, hopefully, hopefully, again, this is premised on so many maybes, like you say, uh, hopefully something that's better than a single model, right? So that's, that's perhaps one, I, I think, area to explore. But the reasoning, predicting the out argument, predicting the reasoning uh, model, it would probably be best suited for someone who is uh, um, legally trained um, in my view, right? Uh, and of course, it is a separate, it's a distinct problem that can be explored at the same time. Um, and one other thing is, um, 
um, with regards to uh, Corina's point on uncertainty, including that uncertainty, because it's inherent in a lot of uh, this sort of uh, novel uh, disputes and even even straightforward disputes, uh, you, you never know. Maybe there's there's some relevant uh, information that has not been uh, surfaced uh, at, at some point, right? Sometimes these things do come up during the course of uh, uh, proceedings and litigation. So. Um, my suggestion is to not look, because a lot of times when we talk about outcome prediction, we look at each case as a single data point, right? So we say this case, there are certain features that possibly these are relevant inputs and we model this towards the outcome. Usually it's a binary yes or no. This is easier to model like what Corina says. Obviously a binary yes or no is much easier than to predict an open space uh, possibly open space of um, arguments because arguments there, there's so many arguments one could make right so ranging from the most ridiculous to the most uh, uh, commonly made arguments so it's an open space it means that it's hard to model um, but if we do outcome prediction it's simpler but instead of using each case as one single data point is it possible for us to gather um, um, predictions uh, from legal professionals for each case so for each case because there is inherent uncertainty, there is there is uh, there are some some possible elements and dimensions of the case that make it um, uh, more controversial based on current current law, perhaps, and and you may get a variety of predictions from the experts themselves. So each case, you're not just collecting the outcome, but rather you're collecting a, a whole. Uh, maybe a whole bell curve worth of, uh, of um, uh, opinions from um, legal experts in that area. And in that sense, you are modeling something that is softer. It's not as hard as like a binary true or false, because in that case, you, you, you tend to simplify the problem too much and, and you lose a lot of, uh, uh, of, of, of the information that the, the case may, a certainty information that the case may have, right? So maybe modeling that in terms of getting predictions uh, for each case, right? So each case, if you have 20 experts, 20 predictions, that's a richer set of data, right? I feel. Um, so, but of course, again, premise on ha uh, having that of that kind of data cheaply available for you to, to even train a model in the first place. Yeah, so those are some yeah. of my thoughts. Thank you. Um, I guess Dirk's hand is up. I think we still have a minute or so. Okay, I'll, I'll be very quick. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm here, hi. In the room, Dirk from uh, from Matthias Law School in Hamburg too, and I want to make a single point because I I'm thinking about Eliza B the entire time, and I think that shows a very dangerous tendency. But by talking about these cases, they are so intriguing for legally trained people that we start to think that that's the problem. And I, mean, I know you're writing a, like an important chapter in a book that will be read by many people in in my profession, legal academics, and. I'm not sure that this is actually anywhere near the problem because I wonder how many Eliza B's similar situations did not make it to the Supreme Court right now. So I understand that there is a hypothetical in which maybe that one outlier could not have happened. Um, and therefore, but people would jump to conclusions and say, the common law will stall and there will be no new cases. But what I believe is what most rational lawyers would have done is tell Eliza B that there's no chance this could happen because they weren't married, they did not fulfill. So probably 98% of all these cases never made it to like to the stage where they could advance the common law. I also think the lawyers, I mean, the, the, that we're making so many assumptions in a world where all lawyers would all use similar models that would tell people like her not to actually pursue the case. I can't, I mean, the lawyers that bring these cases, they are the ones that think, I know that the law is like this, but I think it's wrong. So the, the outcome prediction thing is wrong. I want to change this. So let's make some good arguments about it. And, I'm, and, and I worry that when we discuss these hypotheticals, what, what will stick with people is the idea of you employ computers, you deny important rights to discriminated groups. And so I, I'm not saying you're doing that, but I'm, I'm just thinking that because it, it is so present for me, this is probably what most people who don't want to get into the discussion deeply will take away from those hypotheticals. And then they form their opinion that this should all never happen and be forbidden. And we know that people in the administration and everywhere else listen to legal academics to some extent. Um, so uh, I'm, I think my point is, uh, it's in, an intriguing thought experiment, but it might be dangerous to the overall cause of maybe helping, I don't know, 70 out of those 95 other ELISAs uh, with actually having their case brought forward. 
So I'll just say a quick response to that. I think that's a really great point and I'll, I'll think about it. I do think I, I in the chapter itself, I, I have a section where I talk about cause, what, what do we call cause lawyers, right? So people who are motivated, but exactly as you say, to try to change the law. Um, so they don't care about any sort of outcome prediction tool. They know that they're tilting at windmills. Um, you know, they, they know that they, have an uphill battle to use another uh, uh, phrase. So I do have another example of what I worry about with respect to individual litigants getting access if they have sort of outlier claims, which is a previous study I did, which looked at lawyers, plaintiff's lawyers' choices about whether to extend representation to potential clients who had employment discrimination claims. So nothing even you know, not even cases of first impression or nothing that was trying to push the law beyond where it was. And in the US at least, uh, job discrimination cases on the basis of race, particularly those uh, brought by black women tend to fare very poorly in court. That, that's been shown by a series of empirical studies. And what my co-authors and I did in this previous paper is interview a whole lot of plaintiff's lawyers because we had heard that plaintiff's employment lawyers, when somebody walked in the door and said, I'm here with a discrimination case, particularly a race discrimination case, they said, okay, you'll never win that, but tell me about your pay. Are you being paid properly? Do you have overtime claims? And this was actually in the midst of that giant wage and hour boom that I was talking about um, and on that slide. What was happening is lawyers were doing their own back of the envelope calculation about claim viability and essentially transforming one set of disfavored claims to another set of claims that they perceived to be more viable. And these were not outlier claims. I mean, our federal anti-discrimination statute mentions race discrimination. Um, these were just disfavored claims um, that for a host of reasons, I think like Karina was mentioning, these were the ones that would have lost previously, I think for bad reasons maybe. So I, I do in the, in the chapter itself have some examples that are not so, so far out maybe as the Elisa B or Liza B case, um, because I think the same phenomenon happens with more run of the mill cases, but but cases that have historically met with very little success for a variety of reasons. But I take your point, Dirk, it's a good point. I'll look back and try to be careful about that. 